South Point Church. Uh, it is so good to be here with you today. Uh, I'm really excited about what we're going to talk about because I feel like it's something that we've all experienced and dealt with. So I mean, today we're going to talk about this great thing called rejection. This is going to be so much fun, right? I mean, for example, have you ever been out and saw someone that was maybe like waving at you and you think, do I, do I know this person? Do, do I know them? I'm not sure, but they're, they're, like, they're like waving at me. So, you, you know, you, you wave back, and while you're wildly la- waving back at the person because they're still waving at you, you realize that they're actually waving at the person that's behind you. And, I mean, that feels good, doesn't it? Like, it makes you feel like a champion. Or what about when you were younger and you had a crush on someone, and or may, maybe older, but... That person, they finally call you or they text you, and as you see their number pop up on your phone, you're like excited and your heart leaps, and then they just ask you for your best friend's number instead. (laughs) Oh, man, that just burns so bad. So I don't know if this is turning into my own personal therapy session or if maybe some other people can identify with these things, but the problem that every single one of us faces is that rejection after rejection after rejection is what ends up defining who we are because we don't like rejection. So we learn to alter who we are so that we don't have to face any more of it. But today, we're going to fix that. We're going to fix that today. So after today, rejection will no longer define you. There is freedom coming to you. Today, you see, rejection, uh, it's, it's tough, but I want you to know that we're not alone. You see, we're going to bring it back to the Bible here. Jesus himself, he dealt with a lot of rejection, and today we're going to learn from him. We're going to learn how that we can stop letting rejection form us, and instead, we're going to let it build resiliency and character in our lives. So let's start by looking at the Bible, because that, that's where we're going to find Jesus' journey. We're going to actually start in Isaiah 53, which is, you know, a, a book that maybe a ton of people don't spend a ton of time in, but it's a great book. It's very prophetic, and it was written by a prophet years ago before Jesus, he ever even came onto the earth, and he wrote, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. So Isaiah, he was speaking in a prophetic sense, and he was saying that, that he, Jesus, would be despised and rejected by mankind. And then later in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus himself actually speaks about the days leading up to the end of his life. And, and he was like, you know, in Mark, he says, then he began to teach them the Son of Man, this is Jesus teaching them, the Son of Man must suffer many, many things, and he would be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He, <clears throat> he Jesus went on to say, and that he must be killed, and after three days, he would, he would rise again. So, I mean, not only was it prophesied about him by Isaiah, but then Jesus himself says, look, It is essential that I go through this. It is essential that I experience this. It's essential that I experience this rejection from the people who seem in that day to have mattered the most. So let's look also at what Peter says in in 1 Peter 2, 4. It says, he is the living stone and he is rejected by human hands. Jesus being the living stone, he was rejected Why do we find this specific word, rejection, written so deeply into the lives uh, or into the life of Jesus? It's because rejection is such an important aspect of resilience. So remember last week, we were fighting to build resilience in our lives. And, And not only do we do that through perseverance, like we talked about last week, but we also do that through the rejections that we encounter in our life now, like today. So last week, I gave you a really simple definition for resilience. Uh, We said that resilience is actually bouncing back from disruption. We talked about how disruptions are an opportunity to build resilience. That building resilience, it's like, it's like, it's like building a muscle. I I don't have a lot of resilience because I don't have a lot of muscle here, but you can imagine, you know, 
But this week, I want to add to that definition. You see, resilience is also the ability to bounce back from rejection. So, I mean, we all know that rejection is highly emotional, and we experience it in, in plenty of ways. Maybe you've been criticized at work for something, or, or maybe you were criticized in your, in your neighborhood, or, or you were on a team and, and somebody criticized you there. You know, how you handle criticism without being crushed has everything to do with how much resilience you have. You see, how can we build resilience in the middle of rejection? I mean, that's, that's a hard one to figure out. But to build it for the next time that rejection comes, we, we have some work to do. You see, the, the ability to have resilience in the middle of rejection is a difficult thing. And unfortunately, it can mess us up so badly, it sometimes keeps us from wanting to try it again. In fact, without resilience, rejection will just wreck us. I mean, have you been wrecked by rejection? Everybody has. Everybody has experienced some form of rejection. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you were turned down from a school you applied for. Maybe your spouse wanted a divorce. Maybe your friends had to get together and, and you were not invited, but you found out about it the next day on Instagram. Or maybe it's simply just that your kids refuse to eat what you've cooked, and that's the straw that breaks your back. All of these things feel so deeply they hurt so badly that they, they actually shape and define us for the rest of our lives. You see, the saddest part is that rejection, it paralyzes us from moving forward. It convinces us that we are now damaged goods. We're too broken. We're too broken to be used again. Rejection is highly emotional. It's highly emotional because rejection attaches itself to our soul. It gets all wrapped up inside of who we are. Rejection actually sends us on a mission to go and destroy our own self-worth, our own self-esteem. Rejection disturbs and it destabilizes us from that deep sense inside of us that says, I need to belong somewhere. All of us have that inside of us, that need, I need to belong and when we're rejected, it actually knocks us back. It knocks us off course. It causes us to be unsure. It causes us to ask, do I actually fit in here or, or anywhere? You see, you know what's interesting to me about the way rejection works is that it's so powerful that it can actually feel like physical pain. So have you ever had some sense of rejection that felt like a, like a, like a punch in the gut, I mean, takes the, the wind out of you. Like, it, it actually hurts. You know, I've read that negative uh, social feedback or the sense that you might be excluded from something or, or the idea that people may think poorly about you, it actually influences your nervous system and it produces physical side effects. That's why people say things like, yeah, I just can't get my breath. I feel like I'm, I'm gasping for air. I mean, in some cases, it actually feels like the same thing that physical pain would feel like. And, and if you are honest with yourself, we can actually remember the pain of rejection more than we can remember the physical pain. What is it about rejection that is so powerful? See, some of you have been through some sort of rejection, and it feels like as if you've been a victim to an attack. And it's difficult, uh, it's difficult for you to even move forward. See, part of the reason why, why you can't move forward is because rejection, it just gets in us. It, it actually plasters itself on the walls of our hearts. I mean, wow. It actually gets all entwined in us. It gets entangled inside of us, inside of our minds. And my hope is that, that I believe that it doesn't actually have to be that way that you don't have to be wrecked by rejection, that you also don't have to be wrapped up in all the pain and the hurt and the trauma that, that rejection is causing your life. No, there's something more. I really believe for all of us. I really believe that there's something more. You know, a, a way that we can build resilience, not only so that we can bounce back from rejection, but so that we can actually take a step 
and move forward and put ourselves out there again. We no longer have to pull back. We can put ourselves out there. So I, I want to teach you guys a, a big word, okay? Uh, big words are always a stretch for me uh, because my brain always looks for the path of least resistance and therefore, it just won't use big words. It thinks of a smaller word or a simpler word to use. But a good big word to learn is, is this word. It's differentiation. See, it's a bit, I can't even spell it. If my computer didn't have spell check, I wouldn't even be able to spell that. But don't worry if you're intimidated by a big word. Because if, if we can grasp differentiation in this message, then, then we're going to pick up the ability to not be so attached to our rejection. It's what it is, is it's having the ability to say that rejection doesn't define me. It doesn't get itself inside of me. I, I have the ability to be my own person. Because of differentiation, I can be connected to others. I can be connected to you because we should all be connected. But, but how you feel and how you think and what you think of me does not determine how I feel or how I think or how I act. You see, this is a powerful concept that you can actually be your own person. You don't have to be so closely connected to that rejection that it knocks you out, that it wrecks your life. You see, Jesus is actually such a great picture for us of what it looks like to be a differentiated individual. It's, it's so complex to understand uh, because Jesus, he's walking on earth and he's, he's fully God, but he's also fully man. And so all the pain that we have been through the problems that we have faced, the breakups, the, the being betrayed by family and friends. Because, you see, Jesus was also a man. He experienced it too. He, he knows what your rejection feels like. And, and I want to take you back to an important moment at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry where we see what allowed Jesus to be a differentiated person. This is a moment in Jesus' life where he was given his own identity by his heavenly father. Let, let's pause and think about that. Jesus was, was actually given his identity by his heavenly father in a moment. That, that's an interesting thing to, to think about. You see, because Jesus would go on to build his life, not in response to the rejection or the approval of others, but in the identity that God gave him. Because Jesus, he... Before, this is so crazy, before Jesus did any of the miracles or any of the healings or before he even preached any of his sermons, there was this moment where God seemed to clearly give Jesus his identity. See, that, that story, it starts with a man named John. Not, not John that wrote the gospel account, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Not that John, but John the Baptist or John the baptizer, as it could be translated. See, he was, he was down by the river uh, baptizing loads of people. And Jesus shows up and he says, you know, hey, John, I want to be baptized. John actually looks at Jesus and he says, I can't do this. I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, or, or John, he goes on to say, I'm not even fit to tie your sandals. Jesus says, no, 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 John, it's cool, bro, it's cool. This would mean a lot to me. You have something that I want to show. I want to symbolize what baptism really is. You see, this, this out with the old, in with the new, that's what Jesus was trying to do. He wanted to show people that, that he was doing what he was asking others to do as well. But you see, there's something that happens, not, not during the baptism, but immediately after the baptism. And this is so fascinating to me. I want to highlight this because I think there's something in this for us on how we can, how we can get ready for the rejection that's coming for us. Okay, don't miss this. Don't tune out. We are going somewhere with this. How, how we can bounce back from the rejection that we're all going to experience is, is in this. You see, this is a life-changing moment for you 
And I don't, I just don't want you to miss it. In, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, we can read, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. Okay, that's, that's hard to even fathom what that means. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove alighted on him. Okay, so to make sure you get the, the picture of this, Jesus comes up out of the water. I mean, he's fully dunked, comes up out of the water, and, and it was as if heaven split open, and there was this, this light on him, and, and, it, and the Spirit of God, it was present like a dove. And then here's, here's where it comes. And then this voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my son with whom I love, and in him I am well pleased. You see, what was happening in this moment was that God was declaring an identity over Jesus. He was establishing that for everyone to know. Jesus' identity was not in the rejection or in the cross. The cross is where we find our identity. Jesus' identity was, was a son who had a proud father above. You see, what's so interesting to me is that before is that, is that before this, Jesus had done nothing. You see, there were no miracles that, that had happened yet. There were no healings that had happened yet. He, Jesus had not fed the 5,000. He had not walked on water. He had not healed any sick. He'd done, he hadn't done anything. He hadn't provided for anyone yet. This was before his ministry started. He had not preached. He had not done any amazing sermons. And yet, God's letting everyone know, hey, before he does any of that, I want you all to know that this is my son in whom I am well pleased, who I love. Wow. You see, identity is best when it's ascribed to us, right? There comes a time when what you think about yourself is not accurate. Sometimes I think I'm something that I'm not, and sometimes I miss out on thinking what I actually am. Sometimes just letting other people ascribe identity to me is not helpful either. But there are times in life when you can't just look from within, and, and you can't just look, look around you. You have to look up. You have, you have to look up to God, look up to Jesus, to hear what the Father wants to say about you. And what he wants to say is, this is my son, this is my daughter, whom I love and whom I am well pleased in. See, in in John 1, John was writing about uh, what it was like for Jesus to come on the scene. And he wrote in John 1, verse 12, he said that to all who believe in him, he gave them the right to become kids or children of God. So, So Jesus is saying, hey, One of the benefits of Jesus' death and his resurrection is that now you that's listening to this, you that's hearing this now, you have a pathway to become a child of God. So, I mean, maybe God was stamping Jesus' identity on him so that we could know a little bit more about who we are. That's a big statement. And, and I would just imagine that this is the feeling that actually fueled Jesus in those moments of rejection when everyone else said, let me tell you who you're not. Let me tell you what I think about you. That in those moments, he had to hold on to the one thing that he knew to be true about him, that, that my father has declared over me, Jesus, that I am his, that I am loved that he is well pleased of me. See, sometimes that's all you have to hold on to. Sometimes that's all Jesus had to hold on to. But maybe right now, we, we all, as we're thinking about this, we have this scenario of rejection in our minds. Something that so clearly sticks out. Or maybe some of us are even like reliving that out right now. Or we're living in it today. You see, when you let something other than what God has spoken over you become your identity, rejection becomes a prowling lion on a hunt ready to pounce. 
So I, I have a question for you and a, a little personal story. How many of you have hit rock bottom? How many of you have hit rock bottom in your life? I, I know I have. You know, I can raise my hand. Uh, actually, a couple times, uh, probably more to come even. But I remember that there was this one time, one of many times, but in this one situation, I'd hit rock bottom. I actually had, I had decorated rock bottom. I had flowers, I had plants, I had things on the windowsill. But I was, I was going to make rock bottom kind of a homely place. And the reason I was going to do that is because I was planning on staying there for a, a really long time. And, you know, one day while I was in that, in rock bottom, I was sitting in my therapist's office. Yes, I, I said therapist. Uh, uh, someone preaching said the word therapist. That's okay. We can all go to therapy. And I was sitting in my therapist's office, and I was telling him about all these things that had been going on in our family, some really tough things and, and some hard things. And after I was done talking about all of, all of my problems and my struggles and all the pain that we had been through, uh, he paused, and he asked me actually a question. He said, Chris, uh, do you know that God's heart breaks for you? I, I'm sure I probably looked at him like he was dumb. Well, actually, I know I did, because he had asked me if I knew that God felt compassion for me. Did I believe that I was God's son, loved, and found favor in his sight? No, I did not believe that. And it wasn't because I, it was not true, but it was because I had stopped asking the question in my hurt and in my pain. I stopped asking the question, God, what, what do you think about me? And instead of letting everything else in life determine my identity, I, I stopped asking God and I let everything else in my life determine my identity. So, I mean, I like, I ugly cried. I mean, you guys know when ugly cries and snot's coming out and you're crying and trying to talk and you've got that, <gasps> like that little, you know, bottom lip stutter thing. And uh, so I, I just ugly cried in his chair for the rest of our session. And, and then I went for a walk with my wife. You see, you can't live your life being afraid of rejection and failure. I, I, I don't want your hurts, your rejections, your identity to cause you to do that. Every great person in the world that has tried something has failed, right? I mean, Winston Churchill, if you know him, he said, you know what success in life is? It's just moving from failure to failure. That, that's what success really is. But, but that's okay because you're going to stop believing all the lies right now. We're going to stop believing all those lies. And you're going to rip your identity away from the things that you are letting define you. And instead, you're going to declare over yourself that, God, I am yours. And you love me. And you are pleased in me. And that is enough. That is what defines me. And it doesn't depend on anything I do. Just like God said it for Jesus before he did a single miracle, God speaks it over all of our lives before we do a single thing. My identity is in him. I'm not who, who, who man says I am. I'm not who rejection says I am. I am my own person. I'm the only one that is able to, the only one that is powerful enough, the only one that is good enough and strong enough and wise enough to define who I am is my Father in heaven. That's what it means to face and get through a rejection and then get to the next one and the next one and the next one and still declare, you know what? I'm his child and he loves me. He's pleased with me. I can't even say that without smiling because I know it's true and it feels so good. So why wouldn't I try? Why wouldn't I try again? Why wouldn't I put myself out there again? Because, because what, what, what could actually happen to me? You, you can't hurt me because, because, he, because he has already told me who I am. See, that I, I, think, I think that's the best way to live. In fact, if you've never heard that before, I encourage you to give it a shot. 
I encourage you to figure out in your own life, what would it look like for me to not be defined by the world, but to let God himself define who I am instead? What would that look like? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done in six minutes, so stay tuned in and stay with me. But first, I want to give you something practical. I want to give you a couple of ways that you can apply all of this, okay? We're going to just jump right into it. Number one, would you choose to be honest about how the rejection feels? You can't cover it up. You can't act like, oh, what? I mean, like, I don't care. Like, it didn't hurt. I'm, I'm fine. No, 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 no. You got to be honest with someone about this. You got to say, hey, that hurt. That felt bad. I'm grieving. I'm sad. I'm frustrated. I'm upset. And I, I'm all these things because I don't feel like, like that was right or because I don't like the way that that went. Like, you got to be honest about those things. Or you got to say it because you're worried about, you know, you can't worry about what other people think about you. You've got to be honest. You got to tell somebody. You got to share those feelings. You have to be able to say, this is actually how it feels. Okay, we got to share our feelings. It's okay to share your feelings for everyone. Number two, would you be willing to offer yourself some kindness? Now, that's hard. That's my struggle. Okay, I'll be honest about that. You know, I, I don't know why this is so hard to do, but it is. We end up putting so much blame on ourselves. If somebody else came to you and gave you their situation, you would show them incredible compassion. Be like, it's okay. So what if you treated yourself the same way? Maybe you'd show yourself a little grace. Maybe you'd show yourself a little kindness, a little mercy, a little compassion. I mean, what if you just tried it? That's a hard one because you got to get through a mind battle. But what if you just tried that? So no, number three, the number three thing I want to share with you is, is would you be willing to learn from the rejection? You see, there's always something that we can learn from it. You can't just grow numb to it, and you can't completely disregard it because it will turn into even more regret and shame. If, if you don't learn from it, it just compounds and it gets bigger. But instead, respond to it by asking, hey, what is in this for me to learn that, that day in my therapist's office, okay, I asked that question. I said, God, what is in this for me to learn? And I learned about God's compassion and love for me, especially and most importantly in my lowest moments. And so lastly, you got to refuse to let the rejection define you. You got to refuse to let the rejection tell you who you are. You tried out for something you didn't make it. That's not who you are. That's just what happened. You had a relationship that both of you committed to, and it didn't work out. That's not who you are. That's just what happened. You see, resilience is the ability to redirect your response to the rejection. You can redirect your response to the rejection. It's your ability to redirect how you feel about it, and then what you're going to do about it. That I'm I'm not just going to disregard it. I'm going to actually learn from it. I'm not just going to ignore it, but I'm going to pay attention to it. I'm, I, I'm not going to let it do to me what it wants to do to me. See, rejection wants to wreck me. Rejection wants to wreck you. But through resilience, God helps us establish this internal strength to go, you know what? I can get back on the horse again. I can put myself out there again because that, that's just what happened. That's not who I am. That's just the situation that I went through. That's the situation that occurred, but that's not my identity. Now, he tells me who I am. He tells me who I am. So I, I think learning to build resilience through rejection, it's actually refusing to let others' rejection of you eclipse what God's acceptance says about you. It's, it's refusing to let the rejection be bigger. It's refusing to let it outweigh what God has said about you. I'm telling you, for every single one of us, there is a more resilient version of you 
I mean, it gets me excited. Every person out there on earth, there is a more resilient version of you. And the more resilient version of you will be able to handle rejection from anyone at any time, anywhere. Not because you don't care, but because you already know who you are. You know that you're his. Your identity is in him. Yeah, I might be rejected by humans, but I'm accepted by God. You see, this culture that we live in right now, our culture loves, it just loves to tie us up into knots. You're not this. You're not that. And, and you'll never do this. You'll never do that. But I just want to invite you into a deeper relationship with a perfect father who says, and he says it with a kind heart. He says, would you let me untie those knots? Would you let me walk with you into a life, a life that's described by freedom? Not freedom because you don't care, but freedom because you're already mine. God is saying that nobody can tell you what you're not. No rejection can tell you what you're not because you're already mine. I I really think it's not only the way that we can build resilience, but I think this is the greatest way that we can actually live our life by recognizing that our identity is in one thing and one thing only. And it's that that brings so much resilience to us. And it just shuts rejection down. Our identity is in who he has already said that we are. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that you chose our identity before we ever even came onto the scene. Thank you, Father, that you created us. Thank you, Father, that when you created us, you created our identity. Thank you, Lord, that you gave us just so much purpose and passion. Thank you, Lord, that you gave us resiliency. Thank you for all of that. But Father, I want to lift up to you, and it's so important. I want to, I have such a burden. I want to lift up to you all the people that are out there that are struggling with rejection. They're struggling with resiliency. They're struggling with identity. Father, I want to lift them up to you, and I pray that that your peace can just penetrate those areas and that they can see a glimmer of hope in you. They can see that their identity is found in who you say they are. So, Father, I lift up to you people, everyone that, that, that may be sitting in a hospital bed that's just dealing with a hard uh, uh, thing, all the way up to the person that, that's just living life and everything is great. I lift them all up to you, Father, and I pray that they all know that their identity is in you and claimed by you. In Jesus' name, amen.